Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bursting to the Cloud. I'm very happy to be here uh, with Aaron Black and Ron Bianchini. And today we're going to be talking about how to leverage the power of Amazon Simple Storage Service, Amazon S3, uh, with great uh, third-party storage technology from Avere to provide a hybrid workload, a, a hybrid workflow that allows you to leverage cloud storage, the durability, the performance uh, that comes with that, but also how to connect it on-premises for a fully, fully hybrid workflow that can help you in your enterprise workloads. So without further ado, I'll, I'll hand it off to Aaron Black, who's going to explain to you about the background and use case of how they've leveraged Avere to take advantage of Amazon S3. Thanks. All right, thanks, Matt. I appreciate it. Again, my name is Aaron Black. I'm Director of Informatics for the Inova Translational Medicine Institute. Uh, we're also known as ITMI, and that's the way I'll, I'll kind of reference this as we go forward. Let's see if I can get this right. So today I'm going to break this into three parts, and I'm going to do some pacing because I'm a pacer. Um, what I want to go over is the vision, the vision of our institute, um, the Inova Health System and ITMI, and it's, it's really its vision of precision and personalized medicine. Then we're going to spend uh, a little time, what we've been doing for the past four years to validate that vision. And then what we've been doing, particularly for the IT and the informatics, to innovate, um, particularly using uh, Amazon, uh, S3, uh, EC2, and, and, and Avere has really been the magic sauce for us to, to enable this hybrid cloud. So let me start off and do a level set of who Innova is, what we do. So we're a large hospital system in Northern Virginia. In fact, we're the largest provider of healthcare in Northern Virginia. Uh, Two million patients a year, 1,700. Uh, beds, and uh, the uh, ITMI in general is located at the Nova Fairfax uh, Campus Hospital, and that's what you see in the picture there. Uh, we're a large health care and delivery system, and uh, the Nova Fairfax Campus, um, actually of those 20,000 deliveries, it does 10,000 of those. Um, so very, very uh, large delivery system, and it doesn't matter who I talk to in the area. I moved in about a year ago. Um, if I tell them where I work, nine times out of ten people tell me, hey, I've had a delivery, my, my babies were born there. So um, it's definitely well known in, in the Washington, D.C., Northern Virginia area. Um, so of those, of those uh, 20,000 deliveries, 10,000 of them are done at the Fairfax campus where ITMI is. And if you do some of the rough math, and I know it's a little early for this uh, Vegas time, um, but that's about uh, 800 a month or 200 a week that they're delivered at that campus. And unfortunately, um, some of those babies end up in the neonatal intensive care unit. Um, they're having problems, and, and Inova has a world-class uh, NICU, but unfortunately, these babies end up there and are on 24-7 surveillance. But this is where ITMI and personalized medicine comes into play. Uh, our group um, comes in on these, some of these babies that they can't diagnose, and we'll come in uh, with, our, with our teams and interview the patients, the clinicians, the nurses to understand if there's a genetic component to what's happening with these babies. If there is, we'll consent those patients to, a st to one of our studies. And we not only uh, work with the babies, we work with the parents. So we sequence the baby, the mother, and the father in what we call a trio. And you'll see that as a, a kind of a, a rolling theme in our studies. So we consent and do those right at, at the point of care. If there's other people, other family members that we think are part of this kind of puzzle what's, with what's happening with the baby, we'll sequence them as well. So we'll grab the blood, we have a DNA uh, CLIA certified laboratory, we do the extraction, we put it on a next gen sequencer, and we do the full sequence. Um, if we're doing an entire family, that is terabytes worth of data. Um, it comes into us, we set up custom bioinformatic pipelines, we have scientists, collaborators that are looking at this, we filter, annotate, and for the people who do life science and, and genomics, um, this is a, quite a process to really filter down to what might be happening with that baby. Um, at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is find out that diagnosis. And in the two years that we've been doing this study, we have about a 60% hit rate, uh, meaning we are able to look at the genomics and diagnose these babies, which then gives the, the doctors a way to actually treat them better. So um, these babies are really small, they're very delicate, and it's the first days of their lives. So if we can help them diagnose them, we can actually um, be more cost effective. There's a lot of emotional toll that's happening to these families. So this is where we add value to the health system right away in a truly personalized or precision medicine uh, environment. Um, so this is really the vision of the Institute. The Institute started in 2010. The Innova Health System had a vision of what personalized medicine would become and they want to be a leader in that space. So in 2010 they recruited Dr. John Niederhuber 
who was at the time the director of the NCI, National Cancer Institute, uh, from 2006 to 2010. Um, his vision was to take this massive amounts of information that we were going to generate and actually translate that to patient care. Um, in the last four years, so in order to validate that vision in the last four years, we have assembled quite a team of professionals to um, really support this vision. So we have laboratory services, clinical services, uh, uh, genetics and genomics counselors, and then of course my teams, uh, the informatics and bioinformatics team that support that vision. Um, we also do a lot of collaboration, so there's probably people in the audience that do a lot of this work as well. We know this is going on in many institutions, so we try to reach out uh, as much as possible to help uh, with our vision. So to give you a little snapshot of some of the studies that we've been doing in the past four years, um, I'm not going to go through each one of these bullet points, but to show you the commonality that we do and then some of the differences. So in 2011, we started a preterm birth study that was looking at the molecular associations with a mother who would, might have a preterm birth or not. So we grabbed close to 1,000 families, again, that trio, and we, 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 we kind of divide them into two sections, preterm and, and full term, and we collected not only the um, genomes, the whole genomes, but other omic data, and we'll get into the, what that all is in a, in a couple slides. We also bank our samples. Then in 2012, we did the same thing, but we extended it to a longitudinal study. So instead of looking at it at one time, we're now tracking these patients over 18 years. So when the babies come in, we sequence them. We sequence the mother and the father as well. And then we are doing longitudinal uh, surveys for 18 years to track those babies. And it's a much broader uh, cohort where we're looking at uh, anywhere between five and 10,000 families and 20 to 25,000 genomes, and we're three years into this. So we're actually getting surveys on our first two-year babies, and we're finding out when they get asthma, when they, um, you know, being able to stratify this cohort, and then we can go back to the genetics and say, you know, what's going on with these babies, and we can open up a lot more research uh, based on that. Again, we bank our samples for other omic data that might come in the future. And, uh, and then the third one is the congenital disorder study, which is what, what I kind of opened up with. So these are our major studies, but we do more than that. Um, we have smaller studies as we're recruiting researchers that come into the hospital. We're doing diabetes, obesity. <coughs> we have a, a heart implant study um, as well. And then I put a bullet point up here for ethics. And I only, there's whole conferences on genetics and ethics. I mean, they're, they're, it's way too broad here, but we think about that a lot. Um, in the NICU situation, if we are sequencing a baby to find out maybe they have respiratory problems, but we also find out it's a female and they have a breast cancer gene. Do we have a due diligence to report that to the family, even though they didn't ask for it? So those are the types of questions that our institute and other institutes are going to be running into as you do a full genome, genomic sequence. Um, also, we also have a clinical arm. So we have a clinical laboratory. Currently, we do uh, pharmacogenomic testing, so testing individuals and how they're going to react to certain drugs. Um, in 2015, we're going to roll out another 12 of those within the health system. Uh, we're an EPIC shop, so we do this all within the electronic health record. Uh, and then we're going to do disease-specific cancer panels that will kind of extend that, uh, our scope and, and actually give us a lot more data that we have to store. And then lastly, um, we're working with outside groups to build predictive analytics, particularly on the preterm birth side. So we have two shops across the country that are helping us build predictive models that we might be able to leverage in the health system. So there's a lot going on. There's a, you know, the, the hospital system has a vision. We've recruited world-class leaders. And, and, and now we're, we're, we're moving. We've been doing this for four years. But there's some other things that make us unique in this space. Um, and I'll just go through a couple of these, and you've, we've kind of gone over a couple of them already. But we have clinical data tied right to our research data. So we can send everything through EPIC. We are de-identifying all that information, but we're able to do longitudinal studies. We, we have the complete access to the medical record through EPIC. Um, we're a community health healthcare system. So we, we are directly serving our community. We're not, uh, we're not doing uh, clinical trials. We're not doing disease-specific things. We are actually serving our community the when they come in. Uh, and we think that's a good model for other institutes that might want to do this. And as we extend our services, um, uh, we're starting to realize that uh, we're able to do a lot more than just you know, the research that we're doing. Again, we do family trios. So all our studies do the family unit. Um, and then, again, non-disease-specific, longitudinal, and then the next one is really the large and diverse cohort. Because we're located so close to Washington, one of the derivatives of what's happening is that we get a lot of nationalities of where these people were born. We have a lot of transient people. So of our genomes that we have currently in-house, there's over 100 different countries of origin where these people were born. And I'll show you a map here in a minute of how that looks. But it was kind of not one of the things that we really thought would happen four years ago. 
It just kind of happened because of where we were located. Um, but we're finding a lot of ways that we can create reference specific genomes, ways to filter out noise that, you know, really aren't causing any kind of health problems. Um, on, the on the data quality side, you know, we think we're a little bit different because we, ha we, we do have complete whole genomes. We do the complete medical record. Uh, we're a clear regulated lab. And then from the interoperability standpoint, all our SOPs of our studies are very consistent. So we're not, if we, if we were doing those four or five studies that you saw, the way we get the samples, the way we put them on the machines, how we can, we can um, compare them across studies is very consistent. So we can leverage the power of all our studies together. And then the last one is, again, just another bullet point. There's conferences about uh, the government and how they're going to look at this stuff, um, the FDA, the CDC, how you return these to patients. Because we're so close to Washington, we've already started to broker some conversations as we look at how we're going to uh, do more clinical services, how, how, are, how are we going to be reg regulated from the government. So this is a map, a big map of the, of the genomes themselves, um, <clears throat> where they're coming from. So you can see we have a pretty, pretty large and diverse set. Um, the darker the colors, the more we have. So we cover, most of the, we cover every continent, most of the world. Obviously, mostly our, our patients are coming from North and South America. <clears throat> So the stats, we're IT people, we love stats, um, and informatics in particular. So right now we have over 8,300 patients consented from 100 different countries. We consent about 300 a month, um, and so then we roll them out. We bank our samples, we have a laboratory system, this is all interconnected uh, within our databases. Um, whole genomes, that's actually a low number, we're actually closer to 6,300 right now in pocket, and these are all on Amazon. Uh, if you do some raw math here, back of the envelope, it's over 30 billion variants that we're tracking currently. Uh, Diagnosis-wise, again, we're connected to the health, electronic health record. So all this data, diagnosis, uh, laboratories, down to the discrete level are all coming into our warehouse automatically every night. <clears throat> so on the omics side, again, for the people who are interested in the omics, um, we do whole genome sequences from CGI and Illumina, um, very high quality. We do RNA-seq. Uh, we do microRNA and, and, and expression for the regulation part, so we have a, a systems biology approach, very similar to um, what TCGA and some other of the, of, the, of the systems do, other the projects. And then we use a lot of external enrichment, so we pay for some, some of our open source to enrich our clinical reporting or our research reporting. So scalability. <clears throat> On the informatics side, so we've, we have a vision of the institute, we have uh, world-class leaders, we have a lot of data. And so when I got here a year ago, they had, it was everywhere. And so part of what we're trying to build, and we're going to talk a lot about a hybrid cloud today, is we're really in a hybrid environment. We are a research group underneath the health system. The research group wants to go fast. They want to, they want to be agile and innovative. The health system says, hey, wait a minute, you have to be secure. And so we're really living in this environment, and a lot of you are living in this environment who do research in an academic setting or in a hospital setting of, of serving two masters. <clears throat> so. We, we, as an informatics team, have to embrace the struggle between that and find the right ways to, to, to really live in both worlds. The other thing we, we've run into a lot in the first year is resiliency. So we build these big systems, and sometimes it's the first time they've ever run a, an algorithm on 5,000 genomes, things break, right? So we have to build the resiliency into the architecture and then even to our, our methodologies. These things are big, they're, they're new, we have to accommodate when they, when they do break down. And then the last part, is really why we come to these conferences and talk to a lot of great people, and Amazon's been a great broker of this, is to learn and collaborate with others. Because a lot of people are trying to do this, I've learned so much even in the last 24 hours, um, of great things that people are doing, both in life sciences and also in other things. We've talked to FINRA, we've talked to financial, we've talked to oil and gas, people running into the same problems with data. So on the mission side, and this is really what you see in a lot of these textbooks about data and the way the health learning system wants to be. And so, we really feel on the informatics side that we're the bottom two pieces of this pyramid. If we need to store and secure that data very consistently. So as you roll up, so in our NICU situation, when they want to do a diagnosis, they're going to report that diagnosis. Our role is to store and manage that data effectively so that the researchers and the scientists can do their job without worrying about that infrastructure. And so when we're looking for partners like Amazon and Avere, and uh, NetApp, we're really trying to get to the point where we can move up this pyramid very quickly without a lot of, with a lot of, um, with a lot of uh, ways that we can iterate over these things and learn from them. And then as the, the reports come in and they can reproduce some of these results, which are very new in the space, 
we can build, begin to build those predictions. Um, and then eventually learn from those predictions. So this is everybody's panacea or holy grail of not just genomics, but any kind of healthcare system. And where we fit in from the IT and informatics spot is at the bottom two. So if the bottom two bases aren't right, the, the top is going to be really hard to achieve. So challenges, and I'll go through these pretty quickly because they're well known in any environment. What we came, you know, uh, three years ago when we started to do this, we knew we had to have petabyte scale storage. So Amazon was a perfect fit for us. Um, we, ha we knew we were going to spend tens of millions of dollars in infrastructure if we had to build it up front. Uh, and then data durability is a concern for us because we have very large files and if some of the bits and bytes are gone, that's going to affect the way that we can uh, reproduce these results. Uh, on the right hand side, the data movement. So just because you have it, how do you move it around? And how do you move it around securely? And the, the big bolt point here is HIPAA. You know, store it, encryption, move it around. We have to be able to be compliant and it's another reason we went with Amazon. Um, the last three are really back to that hybrid approach of we have a lot of really new things, or really new tools, but we have to be able to productionize them. So building things that are going to be resilient, even though they might, the, the bioinformatics teams and the researchers want to run at once, from our perspective, as I hit myself, um, we need to be able to repeat that and make that an established benchmark. So if we want to become a production environment and become a, a business component of this, we have to understand um, our benchmarks. So let's talk about some of the physical things that we're doing. Um, so how are we building this hybrid cloud and what, what does it look like? So um, two years ago we bought an on-premise, an SGI UV2000. It's a, it's a very large in-memory processing system. It's uh, 16 terabytes of RAM, 1,000 cores, a petabyte storage on the ground. It's built for, we call it the hammer. It's built for in, in taking a bunch of gen genomic information, epigenomic information, putting it into the system and letting their, their systems run um, without having to scale out. Um, and we use a lot of NetApp resources around that for, for um, the way that we evaluate the systems. But then we also have a lot of applications that are sitting within the healthcare system. So this is your EPICS, your laboratory systems, other components. So we have on-prem, we have an ITMI supercomputer, and then we have the health systems protected health information in their systems. And we have to marriage those together somehow. And then on top of that, we have Amazon. So this is where our biological data goes. And we believe, and we've done some analysis here, that we've saved tens of millions of dollars in infrastructure costs because of the way we can scale it out. We're kind of the, the poster child for the CapEx versus OpEx. I mean, it's just the way it scaled for us was perfect for us. Um, we have over a, a petabyte and a half right now. The way we've projected it, at the end of 2015, we'll have over two petabytes of data. Um, and that's if we go at the current rate that we're going at. Uh, but we have a lot of big files, and we have a lot of small files. So there's over 7 million files that we have to account for. Some of them are literally kilobytes, some of them are a half a terabyte. Um, so we have to, to um, know kind of our limitations there. We also use a lot of EC2. And especially early on, before the, uh, the, the on-prem and our connection was working, it was easier for our, our, for our scientists to go up to the cloud and, and use their tools. Um, but we weren't using them effectively. Um, but now, with Amazon as a partner, we're starting to, to build a better relationship and, and know what we can do and not do um, on EC2, at least effectively. Um, and as far as movement of data, we now have a place for our biological vendors to send us the data. We do a lot of off-site biological processing. We get the data in. We can give them a secure environment to give us the data, as well as when we want to have collaborators come in from across the country we don't have to move the data. So one of the problems of moving the data is, well, let's not even move it. Let's, let's bring them in, set them up in a secure environment, let them compute right next to us. And I think that's a common thing that a lot of the larger data sets are, are trying to do, is build these cloud systems so you don't have to move the data. And the last one, proof of concepts, this is really where we're at now, is like we can build these proof of concepts very quickly in the cloud. Um, right now we're doing stuff with Hadoop and Cloudera, taking a large, large sets of variants, putting them into a cluster, and doing a lot of visualizations and discovery. And we're, we're finding really good results with that, but we're not sure if that's the long-term solution for us. Scalability is an issue. We're at 30 billion variants. What if we get to 60? What if we get to 100? Does it scale that way? Now, Cloudera says it will, but we're trying to prove it. Um, so, so a lot of these marketing spins, we're actually doing this within Amazon, and we don't have to do on-prem. So what does it look like from the hybrid side? So what does this all look like from the business? So we get the biomaterials, so we're consenting our patients, we're grabbing them. Um, those go in, we produce a large sets of omic data. Again, this is where we have over a petabyte of it, and this is where we put it on Amazon. 
So Amazon, again, is that logical sense of things. We're putting it on S3, uh, and we go. But then on the, on the parallel, we have these on-premise. So we have our laboratory system sitting over here in a secured network. This is our Epic. This is our laboratory systems and our uh, data warehouse that we built with a flexible data model. On the right-hand side is your on-prem and then a veer. And so this is really, when you look at the bioinformatics people in the middle and the, and the analysts, they're sitting there going, well, I've got electronic health record with all this rich clinical data. I've got this big hammer of a system over here that I really want to use. And then I've got a petabyte of data sitting up at the top. How is this all going to work? And that's, when, when I, that's really when I started. So what we've done is we started to connect the dots. And Avir has been a big component of what our vision is to do this quickly and effectively and securely. Because all those things happen. We want to productionize this, this system. So the first line, the purple line of metadata, we scan Amazon every night. We've written Bodo scripts that take that 7 million files and they bring them down into our warehouse. We then have ETL that's customized to then match those biological data to the clinical data, all de-identified. So at any point in time, we can tell you how much biological data we have, how big it is. Again, we're trying to productionize. So if they, the business says, hey, we want 5,000 more genomes, we'll be able to tell you exactly what that cost is now. Before, we had no idea. Um, so that comes down nightly. And then our, our, uh, what we've done, instead of having our analysts go directly to Amazon, and I'll have another little piece to this, but right now we're having them log in right directly to the um, on-prem HPC. And Avir, what it's doing for us, is now that is a link back to Amazon. So we have fast movement of storage. We have secure movement of storage. And actually, the redundancy, and we talked about this a little last night, is instead of we have a petabyte up here and a petabyte here of storage, instead of having to store them twice, which is a lot extra cost, we can move it very quickly back and forth because we've established a 10 gig connection between um, our on-prem through Equinix up to Amazon. So, we're able to move data very quickly because we're not computing off of a petabyte and a half every day. We're only taking little small snapshots of that. And Avir gives us kind of that special uh, hot cold storage where we can move it very effectively back and forth and the analysts can do their jobs. Um, we still let them, uh, the, the bioinformatics teams go to Amazon, but we only want to do that as needed. And for those of you who've been in the space, the bioinformatics want to go quickly, they want to do their jobs, but they're not really thinking about cost. They just want to get it done. So we, we now are working on policies and procedures to limit what they can do or we tell them where to go just to be more effective and efficient. Um, and then, of course, we can report and analyze out of both. Uh, and those, these are the kind of the concerns we have now is like where do we do the analysis? Where do we let people in and out? So to give you kind of we're going to my last two slides here, um, this is what it looks like. And I think, Matt, you helped me with this because it was a mess when I did it. Um, there's a lot of complicated things going on here, and he did a nice job of summarizing it. You can really think about it as four bubbles. On the left-hand side, the Amazon side, which is our cloud, and the right-hand side is Nova, which is our on-prem. And then we have a 10 gig connection between the two, and we're going to be synchronizing that back and forth um, based on really the use cases that were given by our scientists, and Avir is going to be brokering that. So, you know, we get our data from our vendors, we put it in S3, we'll have policies to get it to Glacier, um, so we have uh, efficient storage with the knowledge that if we ever have to bring it out and rehydrate it, there's costs associated with that. But we don't, we don't do a lot of that. We do that maybe yearly. We are doing, like I said, proof of concepts. We call them big data engines. So we're trying to find more efficient ways to grab the data instead of tableizing it. Um, relational data systems don't typically work with the sub, uh, semi-structured data that we're getting, and we're getting it so fast that we're putting it into more um, Hadoop, SQL types of environments like Impala and doing proof of concepts. Uh, obviously a lot of EC2 up there as well, and we just signed our BA with Amazon two or three weeks ago, and I don't know if any of the individuals are here that helped us do that, but that was a, an amazing accomplishment because it took us a year. Um, and then on the right-hand side, um, again, Anova. So this is our HPC, our environments, our epics, and we have all that data coming in uh, nightly so that we can match those two things together. So how does this all work? That's a lot of, a lot of words, a lot of visuals on, on what's happening. But if you remember our original scenario with the NICU babies, that still takes weeks, if not months, to, to get those results back because you have to, to really step through that process. But what we're, we're starting to see now is as we build that methodology, that production system through, we're able to take those things that take days and days and days, and we're moving them down to hours. It makes us more effective to, you know, to faster outcomes for our patients. Um, improve patient care, and we're only doing that for a sliver right now, but what we see is that we can do this over and over again in an agile environment. It gives us a lot more, um, lot, a lot of more time for the scientists actually to do the, what they really like to do, not move data around, not write, write command line. They really want to analyze the data. 
So, and then, and then as, of course, the, the prediction piece, really the holy grail is, what if we could stop the baby from even coming to the NICU? What if we could pre-screen them? What if we could kind of get ahead of that? And so instead of them end up in the NICU, um, our systems could actually help them and, and provide them guidance so that they would never, they'd never show up there. So with that, I'm gonna bring up Ron, and he's gonna give you more detail about the Avere system. Thanks, Eric. Yep. Um, so I'm always in awe after talking to Aaron. So I know his mission is to change patients' lives. Our mission is to make storage go faster. Slightly smaller goal. Um, but, but very recently, this year, it's been about making storage go faster, but also making the cloud go faster. So Avir is a six-year-old company. We are um, based in Pittsburgh. We're mainly based in Pittsburgh because the founders were all file system nerds from Carnegie Mellon, and I'd say probably two-thirds of engineering. We hire as many CMU grads as we can, and it's, if you all know storage systems, it's all about the file system and making that performant and making that work with the latencies that the, the, the cloud brings. Um, so really the, 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 the important piece of Avere is that we're a hybrid cloud NAS. So what do I mean by that? Once you have an Avere node in your network, the users connected that Avere node see enterprise class NAS, very low latency, NFS and SMB protocols, and scalable performance, HA, everything that you expect from an enterprise NAS filer, but we're gonna do it with very dramatically different repositories than, than what you see with traditional filers. And, and so the, the big news is that in this hybrid world of on-prem NAS and cloud, we're gonna integrate, we're gonna be hybrid both in the storage side, so the, the second bullet on the slide, we're gonna integrate on-premise NAS with Amazon S3, and we're gonna do that in a, in a shared global namespace way, so you can have little bits of pieces of both, and the users will not see a difference in performance. So we call that hybrid cloud storage, but then by the last bullet, with the release that we just came out with last week, we're also gonna provide compute, we're gonna allow cloud compute to be as performant as on-prem compute, no matter where the data is. So, so the, the big thing I want you to think about Avere is it's enterprise class NAS from a performance and feature perspective, and it's the ability to, to provide that both in a hybrid storage environment and a hybrid compute environment. So let's talk about where we started. So if Avere is six years old, four years ago we launched our product um, and we called it a NAS optimization product. And here what we did is we just took a, 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 we took a lesson from the networking world. You remember back routers, there was one monolithic router. And the networking guys figured out that the routers at the edge of the network did something very different than the routers at the core of the network. The edge routers were all about low latency, lots and lots of connections terminating those connections and getting them onto a big fat pipe. The routers in the core of the network were all about moving big fat pipes around and getting the data to where it belongs. Well, that same architectural transformation in networking is needed in storage. And that was the whole idea of our NAS optimization product. So we came out with an edge filer. Remember, this is the filer, this is at the edge of your storage network. This is where your users are connecting. We want lots of user connections. We want very low latency at the edge filer. And so basically that edge filer is handling all of the transactions. And then what the edge filer is gonna do, it's gonna send big bulk data back to the core filer. And now by pulling the transactions off of the core filer, you can now design that core filer to be capacity and price per terabyte focused. And when you separate those things, you see incredible efficiencies. Um, in both how the edge filer is designed and how the core filer is designed. And so very specifically, the edge filer now is performance optimized. We do the things you expect us to do, I believe. So first, we cache reads. And um, so as much of the read data, we basically dynamically pick the data that we think you're going to read next, and we cache that in the edge filer. But the other thing that people don't realize is probably as important is we post writes. So when a write comes in, we make sure two nodes have it, so it's highly available, and then we act immediately, and now your users move on, because the data's been act. They're not responsible for pushing the data all the way back to the core filer. 
and then we asynchronously write the data back. And the last thing, it was very important for us that you can scale the performance as the edge filer as much as possible. So we support clustering among our nodes, starting at two nodes up to 50 nodes. When you cluster our nodes, they globally share the media in them. So for example, our largest box has, has nine terabytes of cache. When a three node cluster, that's 27 terabytes of globally shared cache. So the way you should think about this is the edge filer holds the working set. It holds the data that you want to transact against. And it figures out which of the right 27 terabytes belongs there. And then the core filer behind us holds the data set. Everything you want to be able to write somewhere, that lands on the core filer. So by taking these transactions off of the core filer now, we're seeing our customers swap out racks full of fiber channel drives and replacing them with SATA drives and getting a much, much smaller footprint yet getting the same capacity because of the increased density. And then in this NAS optimization space, we added a couple of um, data center management tools. The first is a global namespace. Literally, on a directory by directory basis, you could decide where you want the data stored. It doesn't just have to be stored on one NAS device. Your directories now could be stored anywhere. Your users don't see that. They see the same common global namespace no matter where your data is stored. And then the last thing that we came out with about a year and a half ago was this ability to online migrate the directories from filer to filer without having to take your system offline. And so if you think about this architecture, Edge Core, what are our three most common use cases? Well, the first is obviously high performance. You know, with the read caching we do and the write posting we do, a typical offload for us is like 50 to 1. That means for 50 transactions that come in from the user, 49 times we service them locally in the edge filer, only one out of 50 do we have to go to the core filer. So if you have a data center producing X, putting enough of your nodes in front to capture the working set, all of a sudden that data center can do 50 times the performance. Second use case is cost savings. Once we're in, people see that the, our customers see that the core filer gets all the data, but in a much more large transactions in a much more stable way so they can literally swap out those fiber gel drives, put them in for SATA, and you see this massive footprint reduction in the core filer. And then the last is remote office. And this is probably the one that really drove us to cloud. If you think about that system, 50 transactions, 49 times local, one going remote, whatever that latency is to that remote core filer, we hide it 98% of the time. 49 50ths, the user's transaction never sees it. It's only cold reads. Remember, we're posting writes. So it's only cold reads, and we hide that 98% of the time. It's only 2% of the time you see it. We've literally now done benchmarks. Um, there's an industry standard benchmark called SPEC, where we've hit the exact same performance as an old monolithic filer. So think NetApp or Isilon. Um, and we've done it with an 80% reduction in footprint and we've done it with WAN latencies up to 150 milliseconds out to the core filer, and we still got the top benchmark run when we did that. So that was the product we came out with four years ago. So with, with cloud really coming on board, we decided that we already have this global namespace that lets me share across filers. It only makes sense to allow me to do that across S3 buckets. So our release at the very beginning of this year, we call hybrid cloud storage. Basically what we do is we now support a bucket in S3 exactly the same way that, you, we, would, that we were previously supporting exports on filers. And, and so, so if you think about the, the, the three pieces I talked about, the 51 offload, the global namespace, the online migration, all of those apply to this. So, what does the 50 to 1 offload buy you? It means no matter what the latency is out to Amazon, I can maintain that enterprise class performance because the link to S3 is hidden 98% of the time. Second, the global namespace. We are a true hybrid cloud. You have a whole namespace that your user sees. There's just seeding into directories. Some of those directories could be stored locally on NAS. Some of those directories could be stored in S3. The users see no performance issue, no feature functionality difference, no matter where that repository is. 
And lastly, with, the, with that third feature I talked about, this ability to migrate the directories around, you can now migrate directories in and out of the cloud without taking your applications offline. So you, so, and so really what our customers are telling us is that this is the ultimate cloud on-ramp. This is the ability now to have all of your data, all your processing local, and then slowly move the data out to the cloud, and, and the writes are accepted locally, and we do dual writes back to the primary on-prem and to the cloud until the synchronization is complete. And my, the, my absolute favorite thing that we did is we went back to that spec website and we ran spec benchmarks. One of our boxes is good for about 60,000 ops of the spec workload. If you put three of them together in a cluster, you get 180,000 ops. We've done 480,000 op runs, identical performance, and like 0.002% difference in latency to the end user. And those four runs were across a local NAS filer, a remote NAS filer, 150 milliseconds, an, an on-prem private object store, and across the public internet to Amazon S3, and we got the exact same performance. And the, the main point about that is this migration of your data to the cloud, this migration of your data to S3 can be completely invisible to, to your users. And so this, I think, is the use case that Aaron just talked about. It's the ability to keep the compute on-prem, and then they could decide where the data is. And they have this massive data growth, so it only makes sense to put that out into S3. And his users, his compute, his, his supercomputer won't see any difference no matter where the data is stored. So, so this is the release that we came out with um, at the very beginning of the year. The, the release that we announced last week is the opposite of that. It's what we call hybrid cloud compute. So take a look at this picture. So the, the beginning of the year release was our 4.0 version. This is, what we, this is what we supported as of January. So you have a physical Avere filer, and then you have your compute on-prem. So on customer-prem is our hardware boxes, and that's where your users and your servers and your applications are. And in the NAS optimization world, we supported all of the core filers on-prem as well. Well, with the 4.0 release, we now basically support the S3 interface, and we started supporting Amazon S3. At the same time, because it's S3, we've also picked up um, on-premise private cloud vendors as well. So you really can mix and match all the above. Well, what we came out with last week was we literally took the software on our hardware platform and we created a, um, a, a virtual instance of it in EC2. And because it's the exact same software that runs on our hardware, all of the interfaces are exactly the same. So this means we support all of the storage repositories that we supported in the 4.0 timeframe. So if you, wanted to say, if you wanted to stay completely virtual, you can run virtual FXT, you can run your compute in Amazon, and you can keep your data in S3. But, but the, the one, so that I should make this really clear, the thing that's important about this picture Really, the way we tell our customers to architect our box, the edge filer is what keeps latency low. So all that's important is that you put the edge filers near your users, because that's what keeps that transactional latency low. But then on the opposite side, on the 50 to 1 side, so on the 2% of the time, we don't really care, care where the repository is. You can put that as far away as you want. So for us to support compute in EC2, I had to get my box as close to that compute engine as possible, and that's how we keep latency low out there. All right, so with this release now, I can support on-prem performance and cloud performance virtually identically. Now, so the, I think the use case that we're seeing the absolute most traction in the market is when we reach back into the core filers on-prem. We call this cloud bursting. We're the only vendor that can support this, and it's because of our roots in trying to speed up um, NFS, trying to make NFS go faster. Basically, what you could do, you can imagine a customer that's 100% on-prem. So they have their NAS storage on-prem, they have their compute servers on-prem, but, but they have some workload that they need to get done. They don't want to go by the servers to do it. They just want to spin up you know, 1,000 EC2 instances and get that very low latency performance to the data without having to copy the data out. And that's exactly what this does. You spin up the, the FXT instances, you point it back, we NFS mount, 
the, the storage that you have on-prem, and we make it appear to all the instances, to all the EC2 compute instances you, you bring up in the cloud, we make it appear to them that that storage is right next to them. And so they get the latency, the very, very low latency that Amazon provides in the EC2 infrastructure. Okay. And so I think, so the summary for Avere is if you look at the enterprise storage vendors, if you look at the people targeting enterprise storage, you know, it's, it's all about um, dedicated hardware. It's all about proprietary hardware. It's all about proprietary connections to disk. It's, it's all this equipment on-prem. But you get this, this NFS and SMB performance. You get the clustering. You get the HA. The, but so, so there's the traditional enterprise storage vendors that provide that. If you look at the cloud vendors, the cloud vendors outside of Avir are really just trying to provide functionally correct path from users to storage. They're not trying to maintain that enterprise experience. And so the, the only customer, the only vendor in that center of trying to provide enterprise NAS and the ability to do hybrid storage and hybrid compute is Avir. And that's really where we're distinguishing ourselves, is really targeting enterprise and showing them how to get the same performance and this ability to migrate in and out of the cloud. OK, Matt. Thank you. Thanks, Ron. So what I really like about this story is I, I'm a solutions architect for Amazon, and I, and I work with a lot of enterprise customers who, you know, to, to Ron's point and what he was talking about before, they really struggle to have a high-performance NAS in the cloud. You know, something as simple as having a, an HA high-performance NFS interface to get at your files is actually a really difficult problem to solve, and Avir makes that really easy. But Aaron, what I, what I loved most about that is that what I think AWS is allowing uh, Innova to do is, is innovate. You know, the, 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 the part that was just skimmed over there is that you're able to spin up Cloudera clusters just to test and to tweak and to tune. And not only that, but, but bridge a, a giant cloud storage system in Amazon S3 with existing uh, assets that you need on-premises, like supercomputers. And so that ability to, to innovate, to not only grow the amount of data that you can store cost-effectively, but also join on-premises workloads, very specialized hardware with cloud storage, and use you know, interfaces like NFS and, and NAS that you're used to using on-premises in the cloud. Putting those two things together allow you to both innovate and operate using your enterprise tools. So I'd like to thank Ron and Aaron for coming. It's, it's an exciting story. It's something we see in a lot of verticals, life sciences, finance, and many others. And if you'd like to learn more and if you have any questions, we're going to be hanging out outside of this room after the session, and I invite you to come and have a chat with us to dig a little deeper into how we're building these hybrid storage solutions. So thank you. <laughs>